All right, here we go. Friday. Three thirty PM headed home. Army, with U.S. support, is pushing hard to retake the city from ISIS militants. My BBC colleague Shana Halil was in the nearby city of Erbil, and she was speaking with people who managed to escape the fighting around Mosul. Shaima joins me now from her base in Qatar. So tell us who you met, Shaima, and what were their emotions having escaped the grip of ISIS? Well, I managed to meet the Shahud family. They, they had just been in the Khazar camp which was about 30 minutes from where I was in Erbil. They were there three days, and they said that for the first time in more than two years, they were able to sleep well. And when I asked them why, they said because they were, it was the first time that they were able to sleep without the fear of being punished by the so-called Islamic State. And the reason for that was that their youngest son, Ashraf, who's 17 years old, was abducted a few months back by IS fighters because the accused family of having two other sons, his brothers, who had, according to them, joined the Kurdish Peshmerga forces. This wasn't true, according to the family, but the IS fighters still accused them of joining the Peshmerga forces, and they tortured young Ashraf for seven hours. And while we were sitting in their tent, his mother was crying as Ashraf described to me what had happened to him. So he was abducted, taken into a tunnel, and then into a house far away. And he said they just kept lashing me and hitting me and smashing my head against the wall. And they kept asking, where are your brothers? Which mountain are they fighting us from? Your brothers are Peshmerga. And whenever he said, look, my brothers are nothing of the sort, he said they kept hitting me harder. And then he showed me a bruise on his arm. And I said, is that from the beating? And he said, no, that's from the electric shock. And then he went on to describe how by the end of it, his face was swollen, his lips were swollen, he couldn't feel his back. But then he said they put a knife against my neck and they kept firing over his head. And what he didn't know was that his mother at that point and his father had followed the car that had taken him and were begging literally for his life outside that house. His mother, through her tears, told me, I, I just stood in front of those eyes fighters. And it's not a usual scene because normally eyes fighters don't speak to women. Women aren't allowed to speak to them. They cover their face. But she said, I just stood there and I said, take me, put a bullet in me, but leave my son alone. Wow, what incredible bravery. Absolutely. And she said at this point, she felt like she just had nothing to lose because it was her son. But she also said that the minute that she had begged for her son's life and said, put a bullet in me, but not in my son, she'd heard gunshots. Of course, her son wasn't killed, but it was just for pure fear. Do you have a sense, Shaima, of any details of daily life under ISIS in Muslim? We actually spoke to another woman in another camp, 
and she'd been in that camp for two years. And she said her two brothers were still trapped in Mosul. And I said, well, how are they doing? She said, to be honest, I don't know anything about them. The calls are quite sporadic. But she did hear from them a day or two after the offensive from Mosul had begun. And she said, first of all, they weren't hiding. Because if you are caught with a mobile phone, that's enough to get you killed under IS rule, especially in Mosul at this point, because you're seen as an informant. So they were hiding their mobile phones. They spoke to their sister. And one of them who basically said, look, we're holed up in our houses. Our houses are like prisons. We lock ourselves up. We don't want to go out because we don't know what's out there. We're running out of food. We're running out of water. But more crucially, we're running out of milk for children. And then she said, my brother cried. And she said, you know, in our culture, it's not easy for a man to cry. But he just said, I don't know what to do. The children are hungry. We are hungry. And sometimes you have to go days without food just because they're too scared to leave the house. Some of these escapees from IS showed you a special stamp that IS had put on their ID cards. Yes. I mean, I don't really know how to describe it other than kind of a visa for living your life. What did these people say about those stamps? Well, I just, I was very curious to know what daily life was like if you were ill and you needed to go to the doctor, if your car was broken down and you needed to fix it, if you right. needed to buy a refrigerator. And they said anything of that sort had to come with a stamp because if it didn't come with a stamp, it didn't count. And that tells you that it was IS trying to prove to them, but also to the world, that they're not just another militant group, that they're actually a caliphate. And what it says, it's a big blue stamp and it looks semi-official as you know a stamp that you'd get in any country in the middle east just to make any document official on it it says or the islamic state and then or the caliphate and then islamic police but they basically said you needed that for everything and it's it's yet another facet of life there of the islamic state saying that we're in charge now and we have our own stamps we have our own bureaucracy if you may and you live under <laughs> speaking with us about her recent visit to northern Iraq and checking in on the assault on Mosul and refugees who have escaped from Mosul. Shaima, thank you very much. Pleasure to be with you. Britain's path out of the European Union just got a lot more complicated. The British government had been planning to start the process early next year. That made sense after a majority of voters favored the so-called Brexit in a referendum a few months back. Now Britain's hot court has ruled that there can be no Brexit until Parliament votes on it. After the ruling, the woman who brought the case spoke on the steps outside the court. The result today is about all of us. It's not about me or my team. It's about our United Kingdom and all our futures. It's not about how anyone voted. Every one of us voted for the best country and the best future. Her name is Gina Miller. She's not a politician. She's a British Guyanese investment manager who has never previously played a role in British politics. Chris Newlands has interviewed Miller for the Financial Times in London. She, she's played a pivotal role. I mean, she, she's brought the case along with uh, a few other um, people, notably a, a hairdresser. Um, but yeah, no, she, she's been absolutely pivotal. She, she's the one who was uh, taking a stand for the one and uh, acting. Yeah, what was it like? So I met her in April. I met her like a, quite a few times. She's, she works in the world of investment management. She runs a company. So, you know, I've come into contact with her as a financial journalist. Um, she is very, very outspoken. She doesn't really suffer fools. I, I know that when you spoke with her, she, uh, she described some of the racism she had experienced as a foreign-born black British woman in the finance industry. What, what was that like? What did she tell you? Uh, she told me she had a nickname, which was the, the Black Widow Spider, which, you know, frankly a, a is... A name she embraced or a name that she was uh, kind of battling with? Well, you know, it's a name that she is completely battling with, um, has disgusted her. Um, it, fund management industry in the UK is, you know, it's it's very white, male-dominated, and she she's kind of sticks out like a sore thumb, really. An ethnic woman, she's very outspoken. She picks on causes and she's she's kind of done that throughout her career and um but this seems to be another one with brexit and all my team. yeah so how has she addressed racism and xenophobia in this week's event? testing testing i know i don't know if you can hear me just doing a test run uh, it's friday november the fourth the time
time is 3.40 p.m. And I'm headed home. So what's the appeal for a Senegalese comedian of diving in 
it's so deep in the US election, it has everything to do with Gucci as boss, the owner of the TV station where he works, Yusu Endure. Parce que le président de l'Union Générale du groupe là où vous travaillez, Yusu Endure, a eu l'idée. The Grammy Award winning singer parlays some of the success of the world.
jar and spilled the juice on the ground and that's when I said I I can't get revenge. Colombians widespread desire for vengeance might stem from the knowledge that justice for victims is a rare thing here. After over half a century of war, nearly a quarter of a million deaths and 45,000 disappearances, there's just too many bones to sift through and not enough money to do it. And then there's the issue of women. They lost their their sons or their compañeros. And the second thing is that women suffered much more rapes and, and sexual humiliations and, than men. Maria Elena is a woman who leads the Department of Gender and Thank you. 
Johnson, the Rose Family Fund, the Tagney Jones Family Fund, and Roger Hale and Noor Hall. The Carnegie Corporation of New York, supporting innovations in education, democratic engagement, and strengthening international peace and security at Carnegie.org. And by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, dedicated to the idea that all people deserve the chance to live healthy, productive lives. GatesFoundation.org. compared to a year ago. That's the biggest gain since 2009. The prior two months were revised higher in terms of job gains, adding another 44,000 jobs. And a measure of unemployment that factors in part-time and discouraged workers fell to its lowest level since 2008. So overall, a solid jobs report showing continued growth in the U.S. economy. Chris Arnold, NPR News. At a federal court in Virginia, a victory today for a former administrator at the University of Virginia in her defamation case against Rolling Stone and one of its journalists. The case stems from a heavily disputed 2014 article entitled A Rape on Campus. The now retracted article centered on a young woman's account of a fraternity gang rape, which turned out to be untrue. The reporter, Sabrina Rubin-Ertley, portrayed 
UVA administrator Nicole Ramo as callous and dismissive of rape app reports on campus. Ramo sued the reporter, Rolling Stone, and the magazine's publisher for seven and a half million dollars. The jury concluded that the reporter, in characterizing the administrator's attitudes and behavior, acted with actual malice. It also found that by republishing the article after questions have been raised, Rolling Stone and the media also acted with actual malice. You're listening to NPR News. It's 4.04. Good afternoon. I'm Catherine Brand, and this is news from North Carolina Public Radio, WUNC. An Army captain from North Carolina has died in Afghanistan. The Department of Defense says Captain Andrew Byers of Roseville died Thursday after engaging enemy forces. Byers' unit was serving in Kunduz, Afghanistan. Byers was 30 years old. Republican Vice Presidential nominee Mike Pence rallied supporters of Donald Trump in North Carolina with four days to go until the election. Pence urged the crowd to move back to cast a ballot before the early voting period ends tomorrow. Again, criticized the media vowed to heal Obamacare until the most important decision in the race was about nominations to the Supreme Court. If you cherish limited government and all the principles enshrined in our Constitution, North Carolina, you've got to make sure you do your part to ensure that the next president who will make appointments to the Supreme Court of the United States will be President Donald Trump. Trump will be back in North Carolina tomorrow and Monday. President Obama, meanwhile, is campaigning for Hillary Clinton in Fayetteville and in Charlotte this evening. Outside groups continue to spend millions of dollars on North Carolina's Supreme Court race, which will decide the court's political balance. The state's judicial races are officially nonpartisan, but the court currently has four conservative justices and three liberal justices. Justice Bob Edmonds, a registered Republican, is running for re-election against Judge Mike Morgan, a registered Democrat. President Obama gave a rare judicial endorsement in the race to Morgan. Governor Pat McCrory has released a flurry of jobs and sporting event announcements. The Hula Bowl, college football's all-star game, will move from Hawaii to Carter-Finley Stadium. And the World Equestrian Games will be held in the foothills. It's 406 North Carolina Public Radio News. <laughs> Support for NPR comes from American Express, offering charge and credit cards to help business owners cover the big purchases they need to make when they need to make them. More about American Express business cards and services at open.com. Sunny, pleasant across the region, 69 degrees in the Triangle, 69 in Greensboro, 71 now in Fayetteville. From NPR News, this is All Things Considered. I'm Audie Cornish. And I'm Hari Shapiro. Heading into this last weekend before Election Day, the presidential candidates made their closing arguments to voters in key swing states. For the Republican nominee, Donald Trump, that meant trips to Ohio and New Hampshire, where he described his opponent as unstable and corrupt. It's time to cut our ties with the failed and bitter politics of the past. Hillary Clinton. a candidate you can vote for, not just someone to vote against. We're going to take a moment and look back on this rule-breaking election with our Friday regulars. E.J. Dion of the Washington Post and Brookings Institution speaking to us from WGBH in Boston. Hello there, E.J. Good to be with you. And David Brooks of the New York Times in studio with us. Hello, David. Hello. Now, all uh, last month, Fridays brought all of this eye-popping news. It was Friday when we heard about the decade-old Access Hollywood tape where Donald Trump was heard boasting of groping women. It was a Friday when we heard from the FBI reviewing new emails uh, with a potential connection with Hillary Clinton's email server. And each time these were called in October surprise. And it seems like the reason why we care about this is really more how they react to the surprise, right, David? How they would behave in a crisis as president. So what did we learn from each of you? Sorry, Phil. Uh, well, when Trump was belligerent, uh, he reacts to any kind of surprise he's reacting all the time. And Clinton has reacted to uh, all of her surprises have more or less been female surprises. And the one we had last week is her. Um, she's down to two and three. Maybe she now, she used to have an 80, 90% chance of winning this thing. Now she's got like a 65% chance of winning this thing. And that's because this whole race, she's never really had a good answer for the email thing. 
uh, EJ, same to you. I don't know if these qualify as October surprises looking back historically, but what did you make about how they handled them? Uh, for the record, I want to note that there are seven hours and 52 minutes left in this particular Friday, so who knows what's going right, to happen exactly. uh, today. we got a lot of time. Um, you know, I think that Trump, uh, you know, the biggest October surprise was the Access Hollywood tape. And he reacted in such a predictable way that, and it's a terrible uh, predictable way. His reaction was first to say, I did this then as women came out sort of confirming that he had behaved exactly as he had said in the Hollywood, uh, uh, Access Hollywood tape. He denied it one after another after another. And so the odd thing, Trump put himself in a position of saying he did this stuff and then denying it later. You could either believe one Trump or the other, but not both. With Hillary, uh, I thought her reaction to um, you know, FBI Director James Comey's strange letter, I say strange because it was so unspecific, it violated uh, long-standing rules and understandings about not intervening in the election. I thought they reacted with a lot of discipline and they, they also reacted uh, with a lot of energy. They actually went after Comey. Now, some people said, well, that only drew more attention to it, but I think as more uh, information has emerged over the last several days about a cadre of FBI agents, particularly in New York,
almost 28 years since my family and I moved to this great city to Rob. And like in any American city, this place for mayor is focusing on local issues, traffic, growth, the budget. But if you look closer, you also notice how the candidates are using identity to get an edge over their opponents. Here's one example. Doral has a large and growing Venezuelan community. Recently, a group of Venezuelans held a campaign event for the mayor, promoting him as the only Venezuelan in the race. North Carolina, cooler than it was yesterday, still pleasant, 69 now, the tranquil 70, Greensboro 71, Carolville sunshine, 63 on the coast, tomorrow will be in the mid-60s, mostly sunny, 
Saturday, Sunshine Sunday, and it's Friday. Goodbye for next week.